All right, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I'm out of my comfort zone. We've been going through some obscure passages in the Bible, and somebody in my office said, well, there's nothing more obscure than Revelations. And I fell for it. And here's the thing with Revelations. You know, I probably spent, I don't know, two hours last night and six hours today on this, and I'm still clueless. So we're going to talk about this entire book that everybody's baffled at. And what I'm going to do tonight is just, it's not really fair, I'm just going to pick some of the obscure statements in Revelations and talk about that and kind of end up somewhere. Um, Revelation, some people think it was a secret code for the early church that was dealing with the Roman persecution, okay? Um, chapters 2 and 3 talk to the seven churches. Pretty sure that the seven churches, they're unique in the sense that each one has their own particular problem and issue, and yet the message to each church is for all churches. And that's what's amazing about God. He can speak to you while he speaks to everybody. Okay? And, and uh, there's, a, there's a context for what's going on that moment. And there is a, a, a wider, deeper message for everybody. So, <clears throat> secret language, code, revelations, it's possible. Um, a lot of people think that revelations, this is an interesting thought, is different periods of the church history that end up with the end times, okay? Um, most of us think that it's the unfolding of how the end times are going to come about, because that's what it says it's about. And, and so, <clears throat> again, spiritual meaning, whether you know what's going on or not, there's spiritual meaning here. And that's why it's, it's edifying to read the Bible. Even when you don't know what's going on, God's going to reach out and speak to you. And so we're going to jump on some of the weird statements. Like the first one is in Revelations 1, 3, when he says, the time is near. And I can't tell you how many people get angry with the fact that this statement is made throughout the Bible because the fact is, the time is near. Well, it's 1,900 years later, and Jesus hasn't come back yet. So does that mean that the Bible is not trustworthy because the authors did not know the timing about the things they wrote of? Some people get a little frustrated and they go to that extreme. The Greek wording for the time is near is eschatological language. It's a prophetic biblical literature <clears throat> that means it's an issue of crisis in a moment of decision. This is serious stuff for you to decide upon. The time is near means address it. Make a decision. Move on it. And if you don't like that answer, when we die, the time has come. <laughs> it is spiritually showtime. And so whatever the Bible had to say applies to each and every one of us whenever it's going to happen. And, and, and I think we need to pay more attention to Revelations because we're 1,900 years closer to the end times than the Apostle John was when he said the time is near. And really, that statement is urgency. To pay more attention to the spiritual battle taking place around us. Revelations is about the spiritual battle. We need to be paying attention to the spiritual battle that is going on around us. We don't see it, or maybe we do, and we, we, we're apathetic about it. But make no mistake about it. Satan's coming for your soul. And the goal is to separate you from God as much as possible. He doesn't have to show up with horns and a pitchfork. All he's got to do is get you to where you're not engaging God. And then you're no threat to him as a Christian. And usually the things we focus on when we're not focusing on God brings negativity into our lives. And the next thing you know, we're all caught up in stuff that the Lord didn't want us to even be thinking about. Um, by the way, in the spiritual battle, there are souls on the line. 
The destiny of humanity is on the line. The soul of America is on the line. The souls of our friends are on the line. And I want to say for you and me, when we don't take the spiritual battle seriously, we miss out on the goodness that God intended for you to have. Okay? Yeah, I'm saved. And there's so much more than being saved. There's abundant life for you to enjoy. Okay? So, the time is near. It's time to get serious, basically. And then as you move into the next couple of chapters, we talk, there's this passage about, or there's the messages to the seven churches, and, and there's a statement that occur, occurs two times. It's the synagogue of Satan. And everybody goes, what's that? What's that? Well, first of all, you have to understand that the Jews had Christians killed and would turn them in whenever persecution arose. And this is how persecution usually happened. The Caesar would come along and say, everybody has to worship me. And what you would do is you would drop a little incense into the, uh, the, the incense bowl when you were moving into the courtyard of, um, of the mall, where all the guilds were. You were required to recognize and honor uh, the Caesar. And a Christian sees no other deity but God. And so it was a problem for the Christians because if they didn't acknowledge Caesar, um, they weren't going to be able to have jobs, okay? But the Jews would also know that Christians couldn't worship Caesar, and they would turn them in, all right? And, and the church had a challenge, because the Jews and the Christians were close. See, the church had a lot of Jewish converts, and the Jewish converts really didn't want to separate themselves from their synagogue that they had grown up in. This is their lifelong custom, their fellowship. And, and what happened is people would accept the Messiah of the Old Testament and then try to bring along Old Testament rituals and national ordinances into the Church of Jesus Christ. You see the problem here. The influence was so extreme that Paul in Galatians, he really has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter and some of the others to say, well, you got saved by grace, but now you're going to go back to works? That doesn't make sense. And again, they were, they were teaching that you had to convert to Judaism, and, and all of a sudden the church that was full of grace and freedom in Christ was now a bunch of ritualistic rules. Okay? It became a system of works righteousness. <clears throat> Now, mind you, Jesus died for you on the cross, but now your salvation's in your hands to keep or lose. All right? Now, does that sound like the salvation Jesus brought to us? No. It is a free gift from God that we receive. We're not under legalistic bondage, okay? We are responding to God's grace that he's extended to each one of us. We don't earn it. Okay, um, <clears throat> interesting question. My wife and I were on a bike ride, and she said, it asked the question, is sanctification required for salvation? Sanctification is when you and I become more like Christ, when we eradicate sin and bring Christ's goodness into our lives, okay? So, <clears throat> is that process of being de-sinned required for our salvation? Well, the answer, I think, is no. What saves us is what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's what saves you. It's not Jesus plus your works, plus the rituals, plus your behaviors, okay? What saves you is what Jesus did on the cross, his behavior for you. However, I do believe that sanctification is required for abundant life. If you want to see the fruit of the Spirit and the goodness of God released in your life, if you want to see the power of the Lord move through you, if you want to be an agent of salvation in this world, then that's when you say, okay, Lord, come into my life and make it happen. How many Christians do you know believe they're Christians, and yet their lives are just filled with devastation and, and sinfulness and brokenness and problems and issues. 
Sounds like lots of people I know. Okay? What's the problem? They haven't pursued the sanctification journey. And, and it's really weird to see a Christian just being totally under bondage in every different way. It's not supposed to be like that. And by the way, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that New Testament Christians would not understand separating salvation from sanctification. Everybody in the Bible, the New Testament, would say, yeah, you, you got saved, and then you went on to sanctification. That's just what you're supposed to do. Okay? And, and so I think the fruit of our lives, when we choose to love people rather than hold a grudge, when we choose to try to bring people to know Jesus rather than say, hey, I got mine, good luck, Okay? When we try to become more like Christ, that reveals what's happened on the inside of us. Very important that you hear that. <clears throat> well, another place it says it talks about the deep things of Satan. Now remember, we're trying to find obscure passages, right? The deep things of Satan. What is that? Well, in 1 Corinthians 2.10, it talks about the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit knows the deep things of God. All right? And on contrast, we've got people who without the Spirit are going to be diving into the wrong direction. And, and the deep things of Satan is the great conspiracy against God. Okay? He's been after God ever since he got tossed out of paradise. Okay? And um, <clears throat> this is what happens. People will, uh, they, they grab a hold of awkward pieces of scripture. Or they come up with man-made ideas. And they pollute the salvation message. And friends, whenever you see that happen, the deep things of Satan are being applied. And I'm going to be real cold-hearted at this moment. You know, we've been going through the, the different religions in our, our Bible study, and we're, we've been talking about things like the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? <clears throat> this is what they do. They reject the deity of Christ, or they manipulate some of the core issues that make you a Christian, and they all have the same, the same focus. It's on you earning your way to God. Now, what do we know about the sin nature in our lives? Can we earn our way to God? No way. The only thing that gives us access to God is the Lord himself saying, I want you to be part of my life. I sent my son to remove the barrier that sin created for you, and now we can have a relationship. It's not about, okay, I'm going to manage, do, you know, sin management here. We can't handle sin management, all right? just not going to work. And so anytime the, Satan can get you to not recognize the love of God and the power of his salvation made available to you through Jesus, he's got you off kilter. You don't recognize the great gift. You don't recognize the gift. And, and you're off. You're off base. Now what's kind of fun about this passage, the, the original context these deep things of Satan, these are words directed to the early Gnostics who claimed to know the deep things of the divine. All right? So John, in chapter 2, is speaking to a particular context where the Gnostics are saying, we know the deep things of God. And, and this is where their conclusion brought them, that they then worship the serpent as the great liberator of mankind. So, does that sound like they know the deep things of the divine? No. That would be the deep things of Satan. And it's kind of interesting. It's whenever you start tampering with the truths, you end up being on the wrong side of the truth. We seem to have a world now that calls evil good and good evil. Okay? That's Satan having a heyday with our society. Now, it goes further. Back then, they used to talk about, <clears throat> they taught this. To experience the great things of God, you had to experience the depths of evil. Okay? 
I mean, you can't really know what you've been saved from if you haven't indulged in that sin, right? The more you get to know Satan, the better you understand God's grace. Now, Paul addresses this, and he says, shall we, shall we sin so grace will abound? May it never be. 